All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the Deputy Director here at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Thank you to everyone tuning in for taking the time to join us this morning. I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Robert Carlin, who's a consultant at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation for a CGSR lecture series talk titled, North Korea, a Problem of Fading Margins. North Korea was described in a recent well-known book by Victor Cha as the impossible state, so far be it for me to try to do too much here in my opening remarks to explain the country and its leadership for the audience. Our speaker can do that much better than myself, and of course, that's the real reason you're tuning in this morning to hear, to hear him and not me. But as a way of introducing the topic, I would just note three big things for this audience. First, North Korea has been a consistent topic of speakers here at CGSR. It's been addressed as a standalone topic. Very recently in the presentations this June by Siegfried Hecker and this July by Katie O. But you can also find the talks by Toby Dalton and George Perkovich and Martin Galaskis last year. Of course, North Korea also comes up as well in a myriad of other contexts in our conversations about multipolarity, nuclear capabilities and doctrines, strategic competition, arms control and nonproliferation, and so on. It's an area where everyone, I think, regardless of your particular discrete area of expertise, could, could benefit from getting a little smarter on. Um, and it's very useful to have a multitude of perspectives on the topic. So I'd encourage those in the audience who are interested um, in the talk we're having today to go back and watch those talks as well if they have. <clears throat> Second, I'd, I'd highlight that it's a very interesting time in, in U.S.-North Korea relations. I mean, it's, it's always an interesting time in U.S.-North Korea relations, but you had so much coverage in the last administration, so much expert interest, so much focus. If people can remember way, way back to two years ago, Things like love letters and fire and fury were the big buzzwords. It was a it was a drama playing out um, every day in the news. And we find ourselves now sitting in a bit of a lull, like we've come off of this big foreign policy sugar high. The, the Biden administration completed its North Korea policy review in the spring. It had all the right grown up sounding words. It was described as, as a calibrated and practical approach. It was pitched as a middle path between the Obama administration's approach of strategic patience and the Trump administration's pursuit of a grand bargain. It prioritizes engagement with allies in the region. It retains the goal of complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and it reiterates the United States is willing to meet with North Korea. But sanctions remain the main tool in the toolkit. Bilateral talks haven't really resumed. Um, there's no sign that progress is being made. It's been a very low key year so far. But as history shows us, things with North Korea can change very quickly. So the third point is it would be really useful right now to bring in somebody with a great deal of expertise, great deal of context to explain this particular moment, where we've been, what, what's worked across multiple administrations, what hasn't worked across multiple administrations, and what this means for the future in terms of what the United States and its allies can do next. The announcement for this talk stated that the North Korean issue needs a new framing and our speaker is absolutely the right person to provide that for us here today. I think historical context from someone who's who's been there and done that who's been there and done that at a variety of different organizations is, is of immense is immensely valuable um, and it's in particular short supply on in this country and, and on this topic so let me say a little bit about the author so you get a sense of the perspective he's bringing to the issue like i said he's a consultant at stanford's center for international security and cooperation which is also known by its acronym of csac but he's followed closely North Korea since 1974, both inside and outside of the government. In terms of the key positions he's held from 2002 to 2006, he was political advisor at the Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization, DDO building light water reactors in North Korea. From 1989 to 2002, he was chief of the State Department's Intelligence Bureau's Northeast Division. For much of that period, he served concurrently as senior advisor to the chief U.S. negotiators to U.S. DPRK talks, attending all the major negotiations with the DPRK during those years. He's visited the North over 30 times since his first trip in 1996. Um, from 1971 to 1989, he was a CIA analyst, largely engaged in studying North Korea and media. And also of note, in, in 2013, he updated and revised Don Oberdorfer's contemporary history book, The Two Koreas, which I would say is one of the indispensable books um, for understanding the Korean Peninsula and, and certainly worth a read for those people interested in, in the peninsula and its history. He has a master's degree in East Asian Studies from Harvard University and a BA in Political Science from Claremont Men's College. 
the ground rules today, um, which will be familiar to many of you who, who attended CHR lectures in the past. Robert's going to speak for about 30 to 45 minutes, at which point we're going to open the floor up for discussion. Please raise your hand electronically, submit your questions in the chat function so we can get the discussion rolling quickly once his remarks conclude, and try to get as many of your questions and comments in the in possible time allotted as, as we can. Um, Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, over to you for, for the discussion and very much looking forward to this presentation. Mike, good morning. Thank you uh, for inviting me here. <clears throat> I hope everyone can hear me. I want to get started uh, right away. I don't have any jokes to tell, so let me, let me get into the the substance here. The, as, as Mike said, the the title of this presentation is North Korea, <clears throat> a problem of fading margins. I actually originally planned the title as, are we there yet? A problem of fading margins. And as Mike said, I, I noted that the issue needs, or might need some new framing as we think about it. Well, preparing for today, I found myself running into problems of the concept of there, as in, are we there yet? And it's also the image of fading margins is a little bit tricky for the people, unless they have a good historical context, which I'm going to try to provide today. Let's start with something that I'm pretty sure we can all agree on, and that's that um, Discussions of North Korea, certainly of the North Korean nuclear issue, excuse me, and US DPRK relations tend to be focused on the big picture. There's a distant goal, it's framed in large terms. And that's a that's a normal way to talk about things. That's a normal way that it's discussed in Washington, in my experience. It's normal, but I'm not really sure how helpful it is. You might think of it this way, spinning your wheels on the ice in Minnesota while looking at a map of Florida is not really a good way to make progress. So let's uh, refine the focus a little bit. To begin with, let's, uh, let's look at one of the important moving parts in dealing with North Korea. Uh, there is a lull today. One of those parts is, isn't moving, as a matter of fact. But it's let's look a little bit more closely at negotiations and at <clears throat> excuse me and at negotiators. You can't have negotiations without negotiators. And it's not a surprise when you think about it that U.S. negotiators come to the table with their own experience. They have their own ideas about how to deal with North Korea about who the North Koreans are. Let me, let me give you a good example. Uh, Bob Gallucci, who was the lead negotiator for the Agreed Framework Talks from 1993, <clears throat> excuse me, to 1994. Bob says he expected polemics from the North Koreans. He expected a lot of criticism of the United States. He expected the talks would really be a political engagement. They would be largely polemical. And he was surprised as he got into the talks at the willingness of the North Koreans to engage in details and very specifically in technical details. There were some polemics. Uh, we had to sit through some, but we really pretty quickly got down to details. How much of this? How much of that? How long was this going to take? So if you look at the agreed framework, and if you haven't read the 1994 agreed framework, including the confidential minute that went along with it, you really ought to do so. Because you'll see what Bob was talking about. Something else that surprised uh, Ambassador Gallucci was that the North Koreans would stake out firm positions. It's not a surprise, but they turned out to be not actually very firm. They would start by saying they would never, ever do something. And then it would turn out that under certain circumstances, they would do it. 
So they could be quite inflexible in uh, presenting their position. And then when it actually came time for the give and take, they would give and take. And my own experience sitting in those negotiations, I was against the back wall most of the time in the second row. Uh, the problem was getting the US side to see when the North Koreans were actually starting to move into the give and take phase because the North Koreans are not glaringly obvious when they do that. They do it, sometimes they do it very subtly uh, and you have to hit someone over the head to make them pay attention. Bellucci found, again, to his, a little bit to his surprise, that language was overwhelmingly important to the North Koreans. If you look at the first joint statement we signed with them in June 1993, the language was actually quite bland because it was just taken from United Nations language. Uh, we, I remember it, we sat at lunch, the American delegation, we sat at lunch uh, in a little office and we just picked up uh, UN documents and pulled phrases out of there, adjectives and adverbs and verbs, and composed a um, joint statement out of that. That language in that circumstance, in the June 1993 context, meant a lot to the North Koreans. Again, if you haven't seen it, you should look at the June 93 joint statement. Uh, I'll tell you the South Koreans were furious at us for issuing that one. Another thing that impressed Galucci was how his counterpart across the table, uh, first Vice Foreign Minister Khan, was very comfortable with the idea of the walk in the woods style negotiations. That is, uh, they could have one-on-one -on -one engagement to try out different ideas on each other, to float an idea, to chew on it, to put it aside, bring up something else. Uh, that's one approach. Uh, Bob Gallucci had no prior experience with the North Koreans at all, and he hadn't he had been some he had done some negotiating, but nothing really like this. If you look at Chris Hill, and I was not in Hill's negotiations, so I don't have an insider's view, but I know I met with him early on, uh, trying to brief him a little bit on our previous experience. And he made very clear that he was going to be dealing with the North Koreans through the lens of his experience with the Serbs and Milosevic. Uh, I thought that was not a good idea. And I, my sense is he gradually realized that as he was into the talks. So to repeat the, the point, um, in addition to their instructions from Washington, negotiators are going to bring with them intellectual baggage. Sometimes that's useful. Sometimes it weighs on their performance and their ability uh, to engage effectively. Now, the other thing they're going to carry with them are the briefings from the intelligence community. And I want to get into that a little bit later. So my, my point is one of the things we need to pay more attention to, it seems to me, not writ large, not the we, but in Washington, is whether and how the experience dealing with the North Koreans sitting at the negotiating table is going to change the understanding of the negotiators on what their job looks like and their way forward. And, and if and when that happens, how does he or she convince people in Washington that this new way forward, which you can see from ground level at the talks, is really going to be effective? This is a, another one of the critical moving parts in dealing with the North. The differences between Washington and the negotiator on the scene. I'll give you two quick examples. I remember when uh, we were in talks with the North Koreans and um, from time to time, Bob Gallucci had to break and go into an office <clears throat> and talk to touch base with uh, maybe four or five people in Washington more senior than he was. 
one one day he had, he had the delegation, our delegation, come in with him and put it on speakerphone, and uh, one by one these people would weigh in with what they thought he should do. Now none of them had ever dealt with North Koreans, uh, and really didn't have a sense of what was going. But Bob listened, and he listened, and he said, "Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh." And then it was over. He hung up the phone and he looked at the, up at us and he said, "Okay, now we go do what we got to do." Uh, that was pretty brave, but it was pretty effective in the long run. Doesn't mean he always disregarded Washington. It's just that he had a sense of what would work and what wouldn't work. The opposite was true with Chris Hill. After the six-party statement of September 2005 was signed. The final day, everybody was going to make statements, and Hill had to read a statement drafted for him from Washington, which he knew would completely blow up the agreement. It was so negative and stupid. He knew it would, but he went ahead and he did it anyway because he thought he had to, and in fact it did. Uh, it blew things up. It set us back uh, several years. My own experience was sitting with a senior U.S. official some time ago who spoke very candidly about his views in dealing with the North Koreans. He was viscerally negative. In his view, the North Koreans were completely untrustworthy. They were never serious. They never stuck to anything they agreed to. The past 25 years, in his view, demonstrated how worthless diplomacy was. And thus, the only thing that would work would be pressure, pressure, and pressure. Well, I can tell you if that's what a senior U.S. official thinks when he or she goes into a meeting with the North Koreans, there is not going to be any progress. It's impossible. What I've just described for you in terms of the negotiations and the negotiators is part of an arch that fits in with this image of fading margins. Let me, let me explain that a little bit. I'm borrowing from a poem from Alfred Lord Tennyson, poem is Ulysses, and the line is, uh, yet all experiences in arch wear through <clears throat> gleams that untraveled world whose margins fade forever and forever when I move. I've been through 10 U.S. presidents in my career, and I'd say that Tennyson's imagery of fading margins pretty much has defined our problems with North Korea, especially, especially over the last 21 years. I'd add that sometimes the problem is that the margins fade not when we move, but because we don't move. And uh, those of you who were lucky enough to hear Sig Hecker's speech or presentation, you'll, you'll understand what that means. Sometimes, maybe our problem is we're trying to slip through the wrong arch. We don't, not sure which way we need to get to where we want to go, if we can even figure out where we now, some of you may not be surprised to hear that, in my view, the exception was from 1994 through 2000. We were actually getting there, there being the goals of the agreed framework, and then to a revised set of margins, which we laid out in a October 2000 joint communique with the North Koreans. If you haven't read that communique and you're interested in Dealing with the North Koreans, you must. You must, because the North Koreans considered it extremely important, really wanted to get back to it uh, in the Bush years when things started to fall apart. Well, before we jump through any more arches, let me give you a little bit more of my background. Um, you got a you got most of it the introduction, but I think it will help you understand why I think the way I do, why I see what I see, and why I'm putting certain views in front of you. Now, I am not a strategist. I was not, God forbid, a policymaker. 
from 71 to 89, at which point I joined the State Department in the Intelligence and Research Bureau. Uh, before that, I was a simple CIA analyst, mostly concentrated on North Korea. In other words, after 15 years working on North Korea, I was an analyst who had never been to North Korea and had never even met a North Korean. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't know something about the place or understand it somewhat, uh, but you're missing something when you're so badly isolated from the subject matter that you're supposed to be becoming expert on. I had been in 1973 to a very tough authoritarian and very poor South Korea. And uh, those of you who have joined the Korean issue recently have only seen a prosperous and democratic South Korea. It was not always that way. And when I served there in the early 1980s, it was just starting to emerge from this tough authoritarian government. It was just starting, the economy was just starting to get rolling, although there were still oxen pulling the plows in some of the fields. In any case, that experience with the South, turns out, gave me a good frame of reference for later observing North Korea and and dealing with North Koreans in the negotiations. And why is that? Because even though this line is drawn at 38th parallel, this really is one place. And there are so many, there are as many similarities as there are differences. So knowing one can give you some ground for understanding uh, beginning in 93 in INR, I became part of the negotiating teams. And then things really got moving. After we reached the agreed framework, we went into the implementation phase. And we had a lot of engagement with the North Koreans on a lot of issues. Like what? Well, uh, missiles, terrorism, heavy fuel oil, liaison offices, spent fuel canning a secret non-existent reactor. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, crazy Americans who crossed into North Korea, food shipments, submarine incidents, and they go well on and on. We had to talk to them a lot. We engaged in hundreds of hours of negotiations. And for me, active in engagement meant a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with North Koreans. People find that a little bit strange because they imagine North Koreans have to always operate in pairs since supposedly they don't trust each other. In fact, um, like Gallucci, I had my own, although lower level, one-on-one -on -one meetings, walks through the North Korean countryside, sitting in coffee shops in New York. And the purpose was to discuss alternatives on how to unblock problems that had come up. In other words, we weren't hurling polemics at each other. We were solving problems. One of my tasks turned out to be crafting uh, US presentations uh, for the American side, figuring out what was important um, and what wouldn't just sound good in the Washington echo chamber, but what the North Koreans would hear that would really get through, that they would understand that they would then uh, accurately transmit back to their capital. The best way I discovered to do this was to compose, compose notional reporting cables. In other words, I would, when I saw our presentation, which I may or may not have helped write, then I would sit back and write a reporting cable to Pyongyang as if I had been on the North Korean side. Why would we do that? Because the goal was to make us look more closely at what we were saying. We needed to make sure the North Koreans heard it in the way we wanted them and to get the critical points. And that means 
we had to understand their perspective. We had to adopt their lens. And then we had to tweak our presentation and to make sure they heard what we wanted them to hear. Now, one U.S. negotiator had said he only wanted the North Koreans to take good notes of, them, of what he presented, that the interchange he had with them didn't really matter. Uh, I would argue that's not that's not a uh, effective way to operate uh, because. When we raise our voice or we use tough words, when we repeat the same themes over and over again, these are not the things that the, the North Koreans will necessarily hear the way we intend them to be heard. Uh, they may be looking for something else in our presentation. Table pounding may just be brushed aside as oh hum. So uh was that effective? Well, you know, we'll have to get to the records of uh, the North Korean foreign ministry to find out. But the fact is we made progress in negotiations and maybe, uh, maybe that was one of the things that helped us. Um, now, where did I get my notions of how to understand what the North Koreans saw and heard and what they would respond to. Let me give you a couple of examples. These are war stories, but they might be useful. Uh, at a meeting in Stanford, I think it was back in 1991, um, there was a tri a three-way meeting of Americans, uh, ROCs, and uh, DPRK officials. The State Department was invited as observers, and uh, I tagged along. And I happened to talk to one of the North Korean delegates, delegates who became one of the ranking officials that we dealt with in later years. Anyway, I asked him about a statement that had just come out from one of the North's front organizations, absolutely exc excoriating the South Koreans. And this was at a time, 1991, when there seemed to be progress in North-South relations. So I said to him, I don't understand. If Pyongyang is interested in engaging Seoul, why would something so negative appear? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. So I handed him the statement. And he read it, and then he sighed, and he said, Mr. Carlin, this is not policy, this is propaganda. To me, that was critical. That was very important. Um, let me think. I'll give you one more. In 1994, we were making progress in the EV framework talks in Geneva, and the North Korean Foreign Ministry issued a statement that appeared negative. It annoyed Ambassador Galucci. Uh, when I told him it actually wasn't so negative, that the final draft opened the way for more progress, he didn't buy it. He said, no, Carolyn, go complain to the North Koreans about this thing. So I pulled aside the North Korean diplomat, who was, in a sense, my counterpart. At that, in those negotiations, the North Koreans were playing sort of a man-on-man -man defense. Each one of them was assigned one of us and would pull us aside and jolly us and make sure there was a relationship established. So mine turned out to be a chap named Lee Gun. Turned out later in negotiations, years later, to be fairly important. Anyway, I said to him, I affected an attitude of extreme umbrage, and I said, what are you thinking? Why would you issue something so negative right now? And he said, Carolyn, what are you talking about? Let me see it. So I handed him the piece of paper, and he went, uh, da, 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 da. Then he got to the last paragraph, and he went, aha! This is what you should be focused on. And I said, ah, thank you very much. Again, uh, a learning experience of, of how the North Koreans uh, communicate, uh, what they think is important and not important, and therefore how we might best be getting through them. Now, when you peer through this arch that Ulysses is appearing through in this Tennyson poem, what do you see? You see a, a littered landscape 
broken pieces of pottery and maybe a few buried landmines. Now, why is that? Why is it that uh, when we look where we think we want to go, we end up finding that it's, it, it's not where we need it to be? Well, I've been watching, so I've been watching North Korea for almost 50 years, which is too long. Uh, my first trip was in 1996. I've been there 30 times. Uh, it is true that time on target is no guarantee of understanding things in the North. But I had a variety of uh, reasons for going. I got to see different parts of the country. Sometimes I went with State Department teams. Several times I went with Quito delegations, northeast of North Korea. Sometimes I went with Stanford delegations, including a couple with Sig Hecker, where we actually visited the nuclear center. And I went there with the CBS News crews, which gives you a different sense of how the North Koreans operate. Anyway, what became clear to me in all of these trips was whether in face-to-face -face contact with the North Koreans or when you're working from afar, their signals uh, and reading incoming intelligence, it's clear that attention to detail is important, in particular details of history and precedent. We can't possibly find our way forward if we get the history wrong. I hear distorted versions of history all the time from senior people. Just yesterday, I heard a very senior U.S. military official repeating a version of history, North Korean actions, that was completely wrong. Not a little wrong. Totally wrong. There's always going to be room for nuance and uncertainty. There's always going to be a reason for deep discussion and disagreement. But there is some solid ground, and we've got to work ourselves to agreeing on where that is and how to do it. I'll give you one good example of when that wasn't done, and that was in the policy review in early 2001, at the beginning of the second George W. Bush administration. I sat through that uh, policy review. It was not serious. To put it bluntly, it was a farce. It was based on a totally false narrative of history. It was a policy review written backwards. Essentially, it was meant to conform to the the review was meant to conform to the policy review of the incoming administration. The result was the disaster we had with the North Koreans from 2002 to 2005, which led to the North first nuclear test in October 2006. Uh, let me say just uh, three minutes of words about the intelligence component I mentioned earlier. Uh, where to start? Um, I, I suspect in the q and I'll be able to get back to this, but my view, and this is not a surprise, I've said this before, um, the political intelligence that negotiator gets from the IC uh, is weak. They'll tell you that. So it's not just my own. It's a hysterical. A historical. It's um, thin. It's a lot of common wisdom. And uh, it's something that I suspect uh, is going to keep dragging us down uh, for some time to come if we can't figure out how to fix it. Because the analysis and some version of history frames the U.S. approach. And that is supposed to be translated into and carried out in the nuts and bolts of the 
negotiations. Um, we need to be looking for openings in the North Korean position, not to declare them closed preemptively. Got to understand there's a great deal more discussion within North Korea than we sometimes imagine. You've got to understand there, at least there were times, there may again be, when the diplomat, the North Korean diplomats at the table actually have some influence on what the North Korean policy is, and therefore shouldn't treat it as a uh, throwaway. That we shouldn't, we shouldn't, as that one diplomat said, just sort of have a tape recorder read our position. Um, sometimes, well, you know, sometimes people say you can't see the forest for the trees. And uh, sometimes someone has to climb up the hill and take a look around and yell, wrong forest. I think maybe some, sometimes someone ought to climb up the hill and shout, wrong arch. Well, that'd be a problem because uh, they have to explain the tennis program. The point is that we have had successful engagement with the North Koreans. There was not a problem in 94 through 2000 with fading margins. In fact, the margins came into better focus as we actually moved towards implementing the framework. Things got fuzzy after January 2001. They're still fuzzy, and I don't get a sense that we know how to sharpen them up. There is enormous inertia, along with skepticism and heavily remembered history in Washington, even today. Uh, if any of you can fix that, all praise to you. It's not something I could fix at the time. I'm actually not sure how to today, although maybe in the Q&A you'd have some ideas to learn. Okay, Mike, let's, let's move to the questions, maybe. 